Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to the class on to the course on Christian history and missions. And um, today we would be covering on a few more revivalists from the 20 and the 21st centuries. And we can uh, we we will begin to study on uh, the revivals and the moments uh, that took place in this 20 and 21st centuries which is which has an uh, impact still over us so to begin with we are on page yeah uh, 62 yeah so if you're following on notes we are on page 62 and here we could study on charles fox parham and bethel Bible College in Topeka, Kansas. This is not the Bethel College that we have at Reddington in our time, but we are going to talk about the Bethel Bible College, which was in the time of Charles Fox Param. So Charles Fox was a young man who lived between 1873 to 1929. He was an itinerant evangelist who was longing for the outpouring from heaven that would make the church powerful in word and in deed. That's nothing but in simple words saying that, you know, he wants to see the people being changed, being transformed from within. And that can happen only by the power of the Holy Spirit. So in 1900, Charles Fox traveled from his base in Topeka, Kansas, to various well-known ministries in the North and Northeast, including ministries of John Alexander Dewey, and also A.B. Simpson, A.J. Jordan, and Frank Stanford. These were some of the revivalists during his time. So evaluating that he saw, he became even more convinced that he needed a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit because he realized that the ministry can move and grow and impact people only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the minute he understood, the minute he got this realization, he started desiring more for the Holy Spirit. So what happened? In October 1900, together with his wife and sister-in-law, Charles opened Bethel Bible College in Topeka, Kansas with about 40 students. Not very easy to get students, we know that. So he's got 40 students who had this burning desire to study the word. So he started the college with 40 and prayer was the central focus of the school. So just three days before New Year's Eve in 1900, Charles Fox encouraged all his students to study the subject of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So especially in the book of Acts and search for the biblical evidence and how a person could know for certain that one had truly received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So here he is, uh, um, you know, he is making each individual, each student to literally have a tangible experience with the Holy Spirit as they search. So the students concluded that the indisputable proof of the Pentecostal blessing was that people spoke with other tongues. So what happened in the watch night service between 1900 and 1901, Later that evening, the Holy Spirit manifested himself with an unusual intensity. Unusual experience that the students experienced. So it was about 11 p.m. as the uh, 20th century was about to dawn, Agnes Osman, who was a student at the school, asked Charles Fox to pray for her that she might receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the manner they had observed in their study. That is exactly the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1 and 2. So after a brief prayer, she experienced the power of God coming on her. 
and she began speaking in the Chinese language and was unable to speak in English for three days. Now it's an unknown tongue for her. This even stirred up the spiritual desire in Charles Fox and the others at Bethel Bible College because they saw how the Lord is moving with this girl Agnes who had a very simple and the earnest desire. You see, Lord honors the desire, the earnest desires of a heart. It does not depend on how long you are in the Lord or how well you know about Him, how much knowledge you have about the scriptures. It's just a simple desire. She earnestly prayed that she may experience the uh, Holy Spirit in the way the disciples and the apostles who gathered in the upper room would have had. Her desire grew in her heart and the Lord who knew the desire, fulfilled that desire. He just poured the Spirit upon her and it manifested by she speaking in an unknown language. So suspending normal activities, they set aside an upper room where they waited on the Lord for the personal Pentecost. So on Jan 3rd, 1901, while they continued to pray, the student body and uh, you know Charles Box experienced a mighty outpouring of the Spirit with speaking in other tongues. So what happened? Many others arrived at Bethel to see what was happening there. See, in the New Testament, when you see, when Jesus moved, when Jesus was walking on this earth, when he was sharing and teaching to the people, wherever Jesus went, there was a crowd, a mighty crowd followed him, a multitude followed him. This is what the New Testament, we read in the Gospels. In the same way, wherever the power of the Holy Spirit is, people get attracted to Jesus. They come, they come to see what is happening. Just like how the Samaritan woman invited, the minute she had an encounter with Jesus at the well, she went and called out the village saying, come and see. Now, now, when this student, 40 students formed, they started meeting into a room and they called it as an upper room and they started praying and expecting for the Holy Spirit to move among them. Holy Spirit showed up to them. When the Holy Spirit showed up to them, it was no more, um, you know, hidden. It was visible. The manifestation of the Spirit of the Lord was so visible that people started coming to the Bible College to see what was happening. So others received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I think some of them have joined now. Yeah. Okay, some of them, okay, so we see that uh, uh, many arrived at the Bethel to see what was happening and others received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and took the message to others. They became the carrier of the word. So this continued through the spring of 1901. By fall in 1901, the building used for the Bethel Bible College was sold and the Bethel School came to an end, maybe due to many reasons. So Charles moved to a rented house in Kansas City and he traveled around the country preaching the baptism and the Holy Spirit and divine healing because wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is signs, wonders, miracles, and healing and deliverance happen. So in the winter of 1905, we see Parham open a new Bible school in Houston, like the one he ran in Topeka, Kansas. So it was in Houston that William J. Moore attended the college, where he was exposed to the truth on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So William Seymour was later used in Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles. Okay, so with that, 
but uh, we will move on to the next person called William Seymour, who studied in this college at Houston under the leadership of Charles Fox. And we will look into him, like how his life was impacted as he earnestly seeked God. So William Seymour lived between 1870 and 1922. And he was a prominent American African religious leader in the early 20th century. Let me check if you can see the presentation. OK. I think now it's clear. So he was ordained minister and a son of freed slave. So he is regarded as one of the founders of the modern Pentecostalism. So Seymour was one of the most in, uh, influential leaders in his time, and he was born on May 2nd, 1870, in Centerville, Louisiana, within the St. Mary's Parish. So his parents were born, uh, re, uh, born recently freed slaves, and were Simon Seymour and uh, Phyllis Salabar, that was, uh, they were the parents of William Seymour. So during Seymour's in childhood, his family had affiliation with the Baptist and the Catholic churches. So on September 4th, 1870, he was baptized in a Catholic ceremony of, at the church at the Assumption in Franklin, Louisiana. So not much is known about his early life, except that he was raised in poverty. Uh, he is from a meager background, lit, uh, received very uh, little formal education, and he claimed to have uh, visions from God. So during his years as a young man, he traveled, uh, uh, you know, traveled greatly. So in 1895, when he was about 25 years old, Seymour moved to Indianapolis in Indiana while working as a waiter in upscale restaurant and hotels. So he joined Simpson Chapel Methodist Church, which was the African and American congregation of the predominantly white Methodist Church. So in 1900, he moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, where he joined the Church of God Restoration Movement, which was also called the Evening Light Saints. So the group was part of the growing holiness movement that embraced a ra radical doctrine that included faith, healing, and a belief in the imminent return of Christ. And even that would indicate by the integration of the race in worship. So during Seymour's time, he, there were a lot of race issues among the black and white. They were always uh, a problem among them. So the group also believed in the doctrine of this um, many other things like sanctification or the concept of dating uh, back to 19th century Protestantism and many other beliefs this group had. Okay, yeah. So slowly, uh, uh, Pharaoh encouraged Seymour because Seymour was a person in, in thirst of knowing God more. He wanted to study the word for which he was forbidden. Like he, he didn't have the opportunity because there was a race issue among the people. However, he contacted, he came in touch with uh, uh, one Mr. Pharaoh and he encouraged Seymour to get in touch with Charles Folks Parham, who had a Bible college, to join his. Bible College for him to study the word. So knowing Charles Fox, he was a white evangelist who ran a Bible College in Texas. And uh, Samo was interested in the concept of speaking in tongues. So uh, they were hearing more about, uh, you know, a revival breakthrough, revival breakout in many places. And they always speaking in new tongues. They also heard about uh, the Pentecostal experience. So here, Samo was uh, uh, 
uh, uh, say more increase the desire to know more about speaking in tongues and also have an experience of speaking in tongues. So with that desire, whatever Samo had with him, the savings or um, uh, whatever the household he had, he sells everything and he moves to uh, to this place, to Kansas, to Peka, to uh, to attend the Bible college under the leadership of Charles Fox Parham who had founded the first Pentecostal Bible school in that city and who thought about speaking in tongues. So, yeah, so Seymour asked Param, so after joining the Bible college, Seymour asked Param if he would join the Bible college for which uh, Charles Fuchs agreed, but because of his uh, segregationist and I mean, because of his color, he was a black, Seymour was black, uh, so Charles Fawkes ran a school with many whites in his Bible school. So he could not, because of the racism during his time, though Charles wanted to be, uh, you know, uh, to accept Seymour and teach him the word, but because of the other students who were not in the level of thinking, he had to request Seymour to be seated outside the class and attend the Bible college. Just imagine, there's a class of students, okay, who are studying the word of God, but say more, just because of his color, is sitting outside the class and studying. Now, he yearned so much for the word of God, nothing of this mattered say more. He humbled himself saying that, it's fine, I will sit outside the college and study. So day after day, Seymour came to the college, he sat out and studied. So Param would only allow Seymour to listen to lessons through an open door or a window. So Seymour attendance did not last very long. Why? Because of this uh, separation. But then still, you see, many of them in the college witnessed and, uh, you know, they were uh, enabled to pray in tongues. But Sema was not able to, but still he had this desire to pray in tongues. So this desire did not quench. And as Samo was there in the class, he slowly became friend with the other white students in the class. So as the college went, uh, as the courses went month after month, he was offended by Charles Folk's racism as he believed that racial integration in worship was a, was a sign of Christ written. But through Charles Fox, Samo appeared to have learned more about speaking in tongues. So he's looking at the positive side in the Bible school about knowing more about the Holy Spirit and knowing more about the gift of speaking in tongues and its effect and his exposure to Param's teaching. So particularly concerning uh, Pentecostal movement, what he learned at the college, was widespread uh, uh, in U.S. those days. So while he was leaving in Houston, Seymour also met Millie Terry, a woman who had moved from Los Angeles and who was part of the holiness movement that was happening at this place in Houston. So what happened next is, um, that Samo was either led to Los Angeles by this woman, Neely Terry, or he traveled there on his own. But what I also read in the other articles about Samo was that Samo got to know that there was a, 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 a opening for a pastor in a different city. Okay, that is at Los Angeles. So he got to know through Neely Terry and he wanted to move there. Now, Samo is not from a very rich background where he didn't have um, uh, any help 
or he didn't have even money to buy his flight ticket to move to that place. But then the students in the college where he studied at Houston, they collected the money for Seymour and bought him a ticket and sent him to uh, Los Angeles uh, to serve there in one of the church as a pastor. Well, even though Seymour didn't complete his course at uh, Charles Folk's Bible College, or he had the experience of the, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit baptism of speaking in tongues, he still uh, uh, grabbed the opportunity of becoming a pastor and he moved. He was led and he moved to a different place. So he traveled there on his own and Terry, that is Neely Terry's description of what was happening in the city religious community, she explained it to him. So on February 22, 1906, we see that Semo preached in this new church at Los Angeles. She he preached who had been ex and what happened there he preached more about the it is a baptist church a second baptist church in that city and he preached more on the holiness holiness and the holy spirit and speaking on tongues so same or sermon extolled the importance of an interracial religion community and of speaking in tongues as a sign of the Holy Spirit. So what happened? Uh, the church leaders were very upset as he concluded the sermon. And that evening, he was supposed to come back and share the word in the evening service. So when he came back uh, to the same church in the evening, the church was literally locked they shut Seymour out of the church. So following this lockout, Seymour didn't even know where to go because he was new to this place. And this was the church that he hoped for to serve in. He came all the way and his very first sermon closed the opportunity for him to continue in the ministry. So he stood outside the church not knowing what to do. I'm sure he knows what to do, isn't it? He would have just seeked God, asking, God, you led me here. Now I'm out. What should I do? When he was standing there in the campus of the church, there was a, a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Richard Asbury. Okay, they came and they met him. And finally, they asked Seymour, if he can come along with him to his uh, to their place and share more about uh, speaking in tongues, share more about the Holy Spirit and the experience of speaking in tongues. So he went along with them to his house and few other people who were like-minded, who, who, who heard the message of Seymour and who, meant, meant, who were touched by his message, joined Seymour at this house so there were two three people gathered in their house and they started praying they started listening they started studying on the holy spirit and on the experience of the pentecost so Seymour, along with the others also desired to speak in tongues as he shared more and more one fine afternoon when they were having a lunch during the lunch table the spirit of the lord showed up over them they started speaking in tongues. Same over the for the very first time, started speaking in tongues. He was moved by the Holy Spirit. And everyone who were present there around the table started experiencing the Holy Spirit and they started to flow in the gift of tongues. So what happened? Many people gathered in this house and there were no more space and they started to look out for a different place. So when they started to look out for a different place, they uh, quickly found a place in Azusa Street. I'll just show that. Yeah. It is a corner building on the Azusa Street, which was a church before. Later, this uh, the uh, later, uh, for some reason, they sold the church and this was occupied by a horse stable where there was a lot of hay and, you know, it was a cattle stable. And here, 
the money that they had could only afford them to get this place. So they took this place and uh, uh, the 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 members who was along with Seymour uh, cleaned this place because I feel that um, this place was in a mess, and they cleaned up this place and they set up a church uh, church setup like they put the pulpit, uh, 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 the aisle was set, the benches was arranged and made a, a church setup which they changed the warehouse and a horse stable into a church building. And they furnished it with few interiors, what they could effort. So with the pulpit and the aisle and the, uh, ch uh, uh, the chairs in place, they started to conduct service in this place. So what happened? They started to conduct three service in a day, seven days a week. And the last day was commemorated with 24 hours of prayer. People started flooding in into this place because they started experiencing the more of the Holy Spirit. People started to come and this place became very prominent during the time 1906 and 1909. And it became a huge catalyst for the expansion of the Pentecostal movement. So there were many leaders or many pastors travel from different place to Los Angeles, to Azusa Street, into this building to experience the Holy Spirit. And everyone who came there carried the fire of the revival with them. So that's how the revival spread to different places from this one place. So Azusa Street became a catalyst to break out revival in different places. So Azusa Street revival was always filled beyond capacity as it attracted many people, thousands of people coming in. So it was a very wild scene. So uh, it started attracting the press and the media and the press coverage only generated more interest in the revival. So Seymour's congregation continued to grow. And he ordained many ministry leaders, he established many churches, he launched a newspaper. The newspaper was called as the Apostolic Faith and he introduced this in September 1906 and the publication went viral throughout nation and international. So during this three year peak period, the church managed to exert a profound influence. So Seymour's message was disseminated across the country. So people seemed impressed that Seymour had realized his vision of a completely integrated religious community. And many religious leaders who visited the church took the Pentecostal teaching back to their own congregation and to their own city and place where they came from. So what happened later? So this Pentecostalism went on to flourish across the country and the Azusa mission's importance slowly diminished. So after 1909, the revival was no longer attracted large crowds. That is, after three years, slowly it started coming off. And when it came down, there were a few problems within the organization started rising among the faithful factors from which you know they were influenced. So Seymour's followers were put off by the throne he had built for himself. So what happened? Um, Seymour, uh, slowly uh, things started uh, uh, dropping off from his church. So the church hugely had a successful newspaper, that is the Apostolic Faith, which was very famous, had to face some kind of um, substantial problem for which Seymour, okay, a problem after uh, Seymour got married to Jenny Evans Moore on May 13th, 1908. Eight. So the paper's administrative assistant, Clara Lum, moved to Portland, Oregon. So what happened? Because she moved, they need another paper's editor. So Seymour appointed another editor. 
and she took her the papers. Uh, okay, Clara Lohman moved to uh, Portland, Oregon, where she became the papers editor. She became the editor, and she took with her the papers large subscription list. And after that, the paper failed under her leadership. So Seymour was never able to recover from that valuable list. So problems started uh, increasing. And in 1911, Seymour was traveling. And uh, uh, Seymour was traveling to different places because uh, Azusa Street, no more people were coming into the street for him to share the word. So he started carrying the word and traveling on missions to different places. And um, yeah, and uh, we see that during his last days, that Seymour spent the final years of his life traveling across the country, speaking mostly uh, to the black audience. And in 1915, he published a handbook on the doctrines and discipline of the Azusa Street Apostolic Faith Mission of Los Angeles. But his influence as a religious figure was waning out by then. So Seymour died on September 28, 1922, with a sudden heart attack in Los Angeles. And he was buried at the Evergreen Cemetery at Los Angeles. So after his death, his wife, Jenny, became the pastor of the church. And she continued her husband's work until she died. So this is all about William Seymour. But what we can learn from William Seymour was in his younger age, he suffered a chicken pox due to which he lost his uh, sight in one of the eyes, left eyes. And, uh, and he also faced a lot of racism. So despite his weakness of, uh, you know, only one single sighted, color he did not give up on knowing the word studying the word he sold all the things that he had to study the word and experience the holy spirit so the desire of him knowing the word and uh, studying the word and knowing the holy spirit made a great impact the spirit of the lord started moving in them so when the revival burst in azusa street as a leader we need to be very vigilant how to host the revival, how we were mindful when the revival was started. We need to be mindful on handling the revival during the time and also when it is coming down. We need to set uh, good leaders in place and also the leadership should be good. In whomever you are appointing, even in the book of Acts, you see, even to serve the food, uh, the, apostles, uh, the apostles or the disciples were looking at the people who were filled with the Holy Spirit to put them in certain position. So as a leader, we need to be very mindful of choosing people in your ministry. We need to be mindful. We need to be prayerful. We need to see God. Does this person carry the vision of what you carry. We need to check certain things and then put the people in, under leadership. If you have a wrong person in the leadership, you see slowly everything fades away. OK, so with that, we will move on to the next person. We'll talk about even Roberts, okay, who was the uh, catalyst for Welsh revival. Uh, so even Roberts lived between 1878 and 1951. The story of evil, uh, even Roberts and the Welsh revival of 1904 to 1905, that is about a year, was a most thrilling revival but also the most sad and sobering in all the revival history. 
So on one hand, we see 100,000 souls in Wales coming to Christ in just nine months from November 1904 to August 1905. So this was the beginning of the worldwide revival that ushered hundreds of thousands more into the kingdom of God. On the other hand, we see even Roberts, the principal revivalist of this more of God, becoming deceived, deluded, and finally suffering a nervous breakdown, which took him out of the public limelight to live the life of a normal. Furthermore, the fruit of the revival in Wales was soon lost through criticism, fear of deception, and a Welsh theology which suppressed the assurance of salvation. So within a generation, there were no signs that a revival had ever occurred. And there were some important lessons uh, for 21st century Christians to learn from here. So let's look into uh, uh look into his early life and how he uh, encountered the holy spirit and how he joined the bible college and how the revival took place so even roberts was born and raised in a welsh calvinist methodist family in logborn so on um, galmorgan and karma tensure border as a boy, he was unusually serious and very diligent in his Christian life. So you, you see, there's a discipline in him. So he memorized the verses of the Bible and was a daily attender of the Moriah Chapel, a church about a mile from his home. So even at 13 years of age, he began to develop a heart for a visitation from God. And he later wrote, I said to myself, I will have the spirit. And throughout all weathers and in spite of all difficulties, I went to the meeting. So for 10 or 11 years, I've prayed for revival. I could sit up all night to read or talk about revival. It was the spirit who moved me to think about revival. That was beautiful, isn't it? So after working in the coal mines and then as a smith, he entered a preparatory college at the Newcastle. As a candidate for the ministry, it was 1903 and he was 25 years old. And it was at this time that he uh, earnestly sought the Lord for more of his spirit. And he believed that he would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And sometimes his bed shook at his prayer, as his prayers were answered. And the Lord began to wake him at 1 a.m. for a divine fellowship when he would pray for four hours returning to bed at 5 a.m for another four hours sleep and we see that he visited a meeting where Seth joshua was preaching and heard the evangelist pray, lord bend us very beautiful isn't it lord bend us so the Holy Spirit said to even, that's what you need to pray. And at the following meeting, even experienced a powerful filling of the Holy Spirit. And he said that, you know, uh, I felt a living power of pervading my bosom. And it took my breath away and my legs trembled exceedingly. This living power became stronger and stronger as each one prayed until I felt it would tear me apart. My whole bosom was a turmoil, and if I had not prayed, it would have burst. I fell on my knees with my arms over the seat in front of me. My face was bathed in preparation, and the tears flooded in streams. I cried out, bend me bent me. It was God's commanding love which bent me. What a wave of peace flooded my bosom. I was filled with compassion for those who must bend at the judgment, and I wept. 
So following that, the salvation of the human soul was solemnly impressed on me and I felt ablaze with the desire to go through the length and breadth of whales to tell of the Saviour. So one encounter with the Lord one encounter with the Lord changed uh, even Robert's life. He could not no more be a normal human. He started sharing the word to everyone. What happened? His studies began to take second place. He began praying for 100,000 souls and a two vision which encouraged him to believe it would happen. So he saw a lighted candle and behind it the rising sun. So he felt the interpretation was that present blessing were only a lighted candle compared with the blazing glory of the sun. So later all whales would be flooded with the revival glory. And in the other vision that he saw, a close friend, Sydney even, staring at the moon and even asked what he was looking at and uh, to his surprise he saw it too and he was an and it was an arm that seemed to be outstretched from the moon down to Wales and he was no doubt that revival was on its way so he didn't stop with that he continued to pray about these visions and expect a revival to be birthed in Wales. He then felt that he needed to return to his hometown and conduct meetings with the young people of Lauga. With permission from the minister, he began the meeting, encouraging prayer for the outpouring of the Spirit in Moriah. So the meeting slowly increased in number and powerful waves of intercession swept over those who gathered there. So what happened? During those meetings, the Holy Spirit gave even four requirements that were later to be used through the coming revival. So the first one, very important thing, okay? Let's remember this, even as each of us pray for a revival. Confession of all known sin, repentance and reinstitution, obedience and surrender to the Holy Spirit, public confession of Christ. I repeat the four points that the Holy Spirit gave even. Uh, it, 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 the Holy Spirit said these are the four requirements that you can use it for the upcoming revival. And the four were confession of all known sin. Confession of all known sin. Second, repentance and reinstitution repentance and reinstitution obedience and surrender to the holy spirit and the fourth one was public confession of christ the spirit began to be outpoured and there was weeping shouting crying out joy and brokenness some would shout out, no more, Lord Jesus, or I will die. This was the beginning of the Welsh revival. The meeting then moved to wherever even felt led to go. And those traveling with him were uh, predominantly female. And the young girls would often begin meeting with intense intercession. And they were urged to surrender to God by giving testimony. So even would um, even uh, often be seen on his knees pleading for God's mercy with tears and the crowds would come and be moved upon by waves after wave of the Spirit's presence. So there was a spontaneous prayer, confession, testimony and songs erupted in all the meeting wherever even held it across the veils. So what happened? There were exhaustion and breakdown. Though he was clearly exercising spiritual gifts and was very sensitive to the Holy Spirit, he became unsure of the voice he was hearing. Then he broke down and withdrew from public meeting. This is a followed and further physical and emotional breakdown ensued him. 
So understandably, the converts were confused. Was this God? Was even Robert God's man? Or was he uh, moved by any other spirit? He fell into a deep depression later. He was invited to uh, uh, Covenless at Jesse Penn Lewis' home at Woodlands. And it is claimed that Mrs. Jesse Penn Lewis used Evan's name to propagate her own ministry and message. So she supposedly convinced him that he was deceived by evil spirits. And over the next few years, he was co-authorized co with Evan, uh, War on Saints, and he published in 1913. And this book clearly delineates the confusion she had drawn Evan into. So it left its readers totally weary of any spiritual phenomena of any kind or degree. Rather than giving clear guidelines regarding discerning the evil power, it brought into questioning anything that may be considered or that might be described as Holy Spirit activity. So even stayed at this Janice Penn's home for eight years, giving himself to intercession and private group counseling. So around 1920, even moved to Bridgeton and lived alone until he returned to his beloved Wales. When his father fell ill in 1926, he began to visit Wales again and eventually moved there in 1928 when his father died. So nothing much is known of the years that followed. So even finally died at the age of 72 and was buried behind Moriah Chapel on Jan 29, 1951. So what are we learning from his life? May his life be both as an example that the more he desired from his childhood for a revival, and uh, the more he seeked God, Lord showed up. The revival was birthed in and through him. But as a leader, he failed how to host the revival, how to raise ministry leaders, and how we should not give in to other teaching or ministering he gave in to jenny uh, when she said that he, he was deceived by the evil spirit and later you see he took it to a different tangent so we need to see god at all time and mainly very important thing is when the revival births we need to maintain a humility keep ourselves submissive to the spirit have a check and also have a accountable godly men and women in the ministry so that we are watched we are accountable there's nothing wrong uh, not, nothing goes wrong in the ministry and we need to be uh, uh, we need to remain true to the calling so use the gifts god has given but we need to be wise to steward the revival to steward the body of christ which god has given Okay, with that, we will end this session. We can end this session with a word of prayer. Can anyone from the class pray? Shall we pray? Yes, please. Father, we want to say thank you. We just want to bless your holy name for this great teaching. Thank you, Lord, for your daughter whom you have used this morning for us. Thank you for the revival which we have experienced this morning. That you receive all the glory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the, your songs you have used in the past that we say they are record today. And Father, we ask the Lord that the same fire, the same mantle that fall on them, let it fall on us in the mighty name of Jesus. That you will spread your gospel across all the nations. In the name of Jesus Christ. We will not be left behind. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray this morning that as we have heard your word, Lord, please begin to speak to us, O Lord.
in the mighty name of Jesus. Christ. Thank you, my father. And please strengthen your daughter more, strengthen our lecturer more, strengthen our pastor more. We pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining in today's session. Thank you. God bless.